This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello, and welcome or welcome back to Self Work. If this is your first episode, I'm so glad you're here. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist out of Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I've been in practice for about 26 years. And a couple of years ago, I decided to extend the walls of my practice to anyone who might be interested in psychological issues, whether you've ever been in therapy or not, and even to those of you who have never even considered darkening a therapist's door. So as I said a few minutes ago, if you are here for the first time, thank you so much for trying this out. It means a lot to me. And if you're a returning listener, I so appreciate your loyalty and your feedback from your emails that you send me. Today, we're going to be talking about how to find a therapist. This is a question I get over and over again. I hear a lot of complaints about it. There are huge wait times. My schedule doesn't fit hers or his, and I can't take off work, all those kinds of things. So we'll talk about whether, for example, to take a referral from a friend or not, and what questions it's okay to ask before you start working with a therapist. We're going to be using some points from two different articles by Dr. Jessica Gold, and of course, I'll put my two cents in, (laughs) but I thought her articles brought up some good points and can help sort of organize our discussion. Our listener email today, which is a regular feature of this podcast, is from someone whose 12-year marriage has ended in divorce, and she's really struggling with picking her life back up and creating a new life for herself. But let's settle in and talk about how to find a therapist. There are many things to consider when you're choosing a therapist, and I've had two podcasts already on the topic. My very first episode was about some of the very practical aspects of choosing a therapist. It's from a little ebook that I wrote called Seven Commandments of Good Therapy. Really talked about some of the business practices you need to expect and what kind of relationship, the consistency of the relationship needs to be there. You need to know what's happening. So you might want to check out my very first episode. And then there was another one not too long ago, which was 97, on how do you know if a therapist is right for you or not? Meaning the question was, do they need to have gone through what you've gone through? And I talked about the pros and cons of that particular issue. Today, though, I'm going to go through a couple of articles by Dr. Jessica Gold that I thought asked great questions. I'll give you my answers. However, she's a psychiatrist, and I'm a psychologist, so we're coming from a little different perspectives. But I thought her articles brought up some really good points, and as I said in the introduction, can keep us a bit organized. I recognize finding a therapist can be difficult. If you've listened to this podcast before, you know that I've had some really crummy therapy in my lifetime, and I've had some really good therapy. But you know, you may be making it harder than it needs to be. The area you live in is, of course, important. There are more therapists in different states or different cities. And if you're from a small town, it can be really hard to find a therapist. And maybe you even know the person that is the only therapist in town. She or he is a friend. And so that wouldn't work. And you may have to travel to actually have a face-to-face relationship with a therapist. Of course, online counseling is growing in popularity, and most of what I read about it will say things like that that kind of relationship is better than nothing, and I do tend to agree with that. However, you have to be careful that it isn't an online organization that doesn't have any criteria for their therapists. So you can check out their website, like Talkspace, for example. So why wouldn't you want to go to someone that you know? It's important to remember that you're giving your therapist information about yourself that you don't have about them. So there's a power difference. You may know them. They may be an acquaintance. But you don't know some of the backstory of their life. And friendships really shouldn't usually happen between therapist and client. 
Now, have I ever become a friend of someone I've seen? Very rarely, but a handful of times, and long after the therapy is over. It's usually because our paths have crossed in some other way that that can happen. And again, I live in a smaller community, so I see my patients all the time, or I see past patients all the time. But when you're trying to find a therapist, probably the best way is to ask a friend or ask a family member. That's certainly the way I often get my own referrals. But you can also get them from family physicians, OBGYNs, oncologists, internists, pediatricians. All of them likely have names of mental health practitioners they trust and have worked with. But don't forget, college campuses with training programs, community mental health centers with sliding fees, or even free health clinics. Sometimes I think people just look at private practice therapists when they're looking for a counselor. But there are many clinics that have really wonderful counselors. It's the way I began my career here in Fayetteville. But there's no way that really you can omit or get rid of the risk factor. But what can help is if you talk to people who you respect and you like that have worked with them. So you kind of know what you're getting. And one of the things that I mention in episode one is that to remember that if the therapist won't talk to you before she or he gives you an appointment, and sometimes in larger clinics, secretaries make appointments, not the therapist themselves, but you can still ask to speak to the therapist. Let's talk a little bit about different licensures. You know, therapist is a generic term, and they're very different training schedules for the different certifications or licensures. For example, I'm a clinical psychologist, so I have a PhD. And what that means is that I went to grad school from four to seven years and finished a dissertation, an original research work. There are other counselors or therapists that have completed master's programs, so they have a master's in social work or they're a licensed professional counselor. There are marriage and family therapists that usually also have their masters. And then there's a new field called life coaches. Now, you can call yourself a life coach and not be a certified life coach, but definitely you want to look for someone, if you're going to go with a life coach, that has a certification. Life coaching right now is not covered by insurance, but generally speaking, life coaches do not charge as much. Where can you find other information about therapists? Their websites. Probably every decent counselor or therapist has their own website, or their clinic has a website, and their specialties will be featured there. Psychology Today has a list of therapists in your area. You can check out NAMI, the National Association for Mental Illness. You can check with your state licensing board and make sure that there haven't been any complaints filed against the therapist you're considering. Generally speaking, I think getting referrals from friends is a pretty good idea, but there are things that are potential cons. First, it could be weird for the person currently seeing that therapist. Sometimes, you know, people will say, well, yeah, sure, I want you to see my therapist. Sure, he's great. But then when you check back, it's they're more people-pleasing and... They really have a hard time with you seeing the same person they are. So then you can call that therapist and ask them for a referral. This was one of the points made by Dr. Gold. And here's another one. Some therapists actually have a rule against seeing anyone who knows each other. Now, again, in Fayetteville, Arkansas, that would be really hard. I remember being in my office, which was tiny, my first office, and people waited out in the hall. And as one person left, I guess someone was waiting, and he said, well, hey, cuz. (laughs) So anyway, we're not all related here in Arkansas, but (laughs) I learned that maybe I should ask a few more questions. But some therapists have been trained that that is just a big no-no. I, for example, don't like to see individuals in a couple. If I'm seeing the couple, I will see the couple. But unless there's something I specifically want to know and might suggest an individual session, I don't like to see the individuals and see the couple at the same time. There are many therapists who do, but it's bit me in the past. 
and actually bitten the patient. They were the ones who suffered. So I've stopped doing it. It also could be the therapist training again if they're psychodynamically oriented or maybe just their own personal feelings. A third point is you might have to consider if you would bring this friend up in therapy. Certainly if it's a family member, you might. I usually don't like to see members of the same family either unless I'm doing family therapy. So if you're likely to bring them up, then it's probably not a good idea for y'all to share therapists. Of course, sometimes I don't know who are friends and who aren't friends, and I find out five, six, ten, fifteen sessions into it that they live across the street from one another or they're good friends. So if there's a conflict, what I will do is suggest to both of them that they come into therapy together. I actually worked for my best friend, who's also a psychologist, when I first came out of graduate school, and she and I definitely had the agreement that if we got into a conflict, which we never did, luckily, but if we did, we'd go to a counselor together. But what you really want to know and feel very strongly is that you can trust your therapist, that they are unbiased, and you're very comfortable with them. Now, I will say to you that I often tell people It is not my job to vilify the other people in your life just because you're telling me your perspective only, which is, of course, the only perspective you can. It doesn't mean I'm going to throw blame on the other person. I'm hopefully going to listen as objectively as possible and then give you my feedback about potentially what their role is in the conflict, but also your own. So when you're looking for a therapist, and you want to use a friend's referral, think about these things. Most of the time, I think it's a pretty good idea, unless it is a friend that you have fairly regular conflict with, then that's probably not wise. Now, the other subject I want to bring up is, is it okay to ask your therapist in an initial interview some questions about them? Of course it is. I've gotten questions like, do you do sliding fee scales or other questions about money? I've gotten questions about how old I am. I've gotten questions about the kind of training I got. Perhaps the psychological system or way of thinking that I use the most. I know I talked about in a previous podcast that had recently been, to me, sadly asked who I'd voted for in the last election. I didn't answer that question. But certainly, I've been asked if I'm a Christian counselor which I don't bring religion into my therapy unless it's important to the person in front of me. I think my own spiritual beliefs don't belong. But there are Christian counselors. There are counselors who will pray with you. There are counselors who will talk more about your spiritual journey. So it's okay to ask. And if they're not comfortable answering, they'll say, you know, I'm not comfortable answering. But some of the questions that Dr. Gold suggested were these. Is there a reason you're a psychiatrist or psychologist, social worker, family therapist, rather than some other title, meaning you want to know how they got to be a mental health professional? What drew them to that particular certification? What drew them to being a medical doctor? What drew them to being a clinical psychologist or what's called a PsyD, which is a doctor of psychology? So you can certainly ask why they wanted to be who they are. Another question she brings up is asking a therapist, can I actually trust that everything I say to you stays between you and me? You betcha. I mean, there are exceptions if you are a danger to yourself or others, and there are at times legal issues, although this has happened very rarely in my practice. But confidentiality is a given. In fact, I have a contract that I have people sign that says, quite literally, I agree to keep everything you tell me confidential. And I also state the exceptions to that. Just this week, for example, I had to call the police to do a wellness check because someone had told me she was suicidal and she wouldn't answer her phone. So sometimes that has to happen. A third question is, if you have so many patients, how do I know you'll be focused on and care about me individually? You know, that's a trust issue. If there are any signs that your therapist is getting confused about who you are, 
and she or he isn't saying, you know, I can't quite remember this about you, but rather they're talking about your father and your father's been deceased for years or they seem lost about whether you're divorced or not, then some of that says your therapist isn't listening. And it's okay to say to them, you know, you're getting a lot of the facts about me wrong and that scares me and makes me highly uncomfortable. It's okay to do that. Other questions are about medication. Now, I'm a psychologist, so I can't prescribe. There are some states where psychologists can prescribe certain medications because there's such a shortage of psychiatrists. But people are afraid sometimes that you're going to only suggest medication. And you can hear their answer on what their take on medication is. There are some therapists out there who don't particularly believe in medication. And then there are others who recommend it when needed. But you can ask. Here's another one. How do I know your advice is good enough for me to take? (laughs) Well, I generally don't give advice. I don't say you should do this or you shouldn't do that. What I try to do very hard, and I think this is what appropriate therapists do, is to say, I'm listening to the way your thinking is proceeding. I'm looking to see if there's anything you're avoiding talking about. Or are you ruminating or obsessing about something? I'm going to talk about the process of your decision making, not necessarily what decision you make. Now, obviously, if we're talking about life or death things, if we're talking about self-mutilation or self-harm, I am going to advise against those things. I'm going to talk about how those are chaotic decisions. I'm going to talk about how outpatient therapy may not be safe for you anymore and that you need to consider residential or some kind of intensive outpatient. Most therapists, just like plumbers and pastors and lawyers, have reputations. And so you can ask around in the community, what's his or her reputation? Do people feel controlled? Do people feel like they are uncomfortable with some of her advice or does the therapist have a good reputation for being solid, for being available, for being on time, for being caring and tuned in? This is a great question for someone living in a smaller area. If I spot you in line at the grocery store, what should I do? Well, again, I see my patients all the time. Now, I didn't when I was in Dallas, ever. I didn't even live in the same area where I was working, so I never saw my patients. I really leave this up to the person themselves. I say, you know what? If you smile at me and wave, I'll smile back. If you don't, if you look away, I will not approach. If I'm with a family member and you come up to me and say, hey, it's great to see you. Is this your husband or is this your son? Then I'm going to introduce you. But if you don't, then that's okay, too. You're in charge. And here's the last question, which I really like. No offense, but what if I just don't like you? (laughs) Should I stick it out? No. (laughs) No, 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 no. The therapeutic relationship has been shown by all kinds of really good research that it is one of the strongest factors in people feeling that their therapy was successful. So definitely you want a therapist that you like, that you think likes you, and that you can see your own progress. I talk about setting therapeutic goals in episode one, so you might want to listen to that as well. Our listener email today is from someone whose husband left her. She really didn't want the divorce. And she's having to deal with the emotional consequences. Hi, I love your podcast and have felt it so helpful since my husband left me. We would have been together 12 years and I feel like I just can't get over it. I'm bereft and lonely and scared for my future. That future was with him and our adopted pet who we both adored. And by the way, he kept the pet. I just see no future for me. All I do is go to work, eat, sleep, and repeat. It's just no life. I'm absolutely dreading the holidays 
and just want it all over with. I am lost and broken and can see no way forward. I'm so grateful for you and your podcast. Well, that makes me feel warm, and I'm so glad to hear that. You know, when you don't choose to divorce, then you are living out something that may not have ever even been in your mind. I was talking the other day with someone who's definitely in this position, although she's beginning to figure out things that she knew were wrong about her marriage or hurtful to her. In fact, very destructive to her. But she said, you know, I still feel married. I don't feel divorced. So really helping to absorb that reality is one of the goals of therapeutic work with her. But here's my answer. I'm so sorry that you're going through such a tough time, and I'm happy to hear that self-work is helping you, even in a small way. If you're struggling to see your way, it could be very helpful to seek a therapist or life coach in your area who you could talk through your issues with. Sometimes simply hearing yourself do that brings clarity. They could provide some objective feedback for you. If you love pets, a pragmatic suggestion would be to go over to your local shelter to volunteer or even consider getting another pet. I know they're not replaceable, but it might help you move forward and begin to have things in your own life that bring you joy. I read a book long ago that really helped me get through my own divorce. One was How to Survive the Loss of a Love. Now, this is an old book. It was written in 1977. I read it in the 80s, but it's still out there. And I have given it to some people. It has just very, very practical suggestions of things to do every day to help you move forward. And the other book is called Coming Apart by Daphne Kima. She talks a lot about what you missed, what you noticed and decided to ignore when you first met your soon-to-be ex or your ex, and what that means and how you don't repeat that. Another exercise I've had people do, and I did not write this to her, so I hope she's listening, is one time I had a patient who had been in an abusive relationship, but she was about two or three years divorced. Her ex was a very popular man in the small town in which she lived. Her children were unhappy going back and forth, and she wasn't very happy. She had had to take a job with her family business and almost felt kind of infantilized because she was back at home with her mother and dad. So I had her one weekend that she didn't have the children have a bit of a little party or get-together with some of the people that she'd known during her marriage because she was really regretting the divorce. Well, she came back with four or five pages of things that had been terrible for her while she was married that her friends reminded her of. I've probably talked about this in a previous podcast, but I'm sure none of you listened to all of them. So hopefully this is a helpful example. We can forget the kind of pain we were in. We can forget if we suffered abuse. We can discount because we're unhappy now or haven't found our way. We can look at the past with rose-colored glasses. Also, I checked around in my own podcast episodes, and episode 61 could be helpful how to increase your self-esteem, doing one thing every day that either you've always wanted to do and never risked, or that your best friend would say you'd never do. That's one of the exercises. It can lead to greater hope that your life can truly change. I'll have all those links to the books and to Dr. Gold's article in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening to Self Work. I love the emails you're sending me at AskDrMargaret at DrMargaretRutherford.com. I will answer them. And thank you so much to those of you who've left ratings and reviews. I picked up an article the other day, or I clicked on it on my laptop. It was about, you know, should you really ask for ratings and reviews? And the consensus was yes. If you want to build your podcast, you definitely want to ask the people who are your loyal listeners to please let other people know what they enjoy about your podcast. So I'm asking again, and thank you again very much to those of you who have taken just a few minutes to do it, especially on iTunes, but really anywhere you listen. There's another way to get in touch with me or be a part of my work. 
That's a new Facebook group I've started, facebook.com slash groups slash self-work, facebook.com slash groups slash self-work. You can subscribe on my website, which is drmargaretrutherford.com, and you'll get a weekly newsletter, that's it, with a blog post and a podcast. So that's an easy way to keep up with me. But I want to thank you for being here today. Take very good care. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self Work.